Yes. I believe you guys have already finished your homework number one. Yeah. Getting close. Any issues you guys are facing, or you are thinking, you are, uh, how are you finding this specific problem when you're working on it? I'm still working on it. To be honest. Mm -hmm. I haven't started on it yet. Okay. For those of you who have started, is it like an uh, interesting problem or is it like uh, matching with what we have learned so far during uh, the course or how? what's the feedback you guys would like to provide? It's too simple, too easy. You want more tough problems. You want more number of problems for practice. Anything, any feedback? No, I think, I think one is, uh, problem would be good enough. I think this one's pretty I good. I think one problem is a problem. coding. Okay, so I believe everybody is speaking at the same time, so I missed your comment. So, yeah, yeah. Can we go? I don't know how to make sure that you guys can actually um, comment, but there's a chat window. If you feel like you want to provide any feedback, you can also provide it. I can read it from there as well. So that way we are not basically cutting each other while speaking. Otherwise, I don't know how to basically synchronize everybody's response while speaking. There must be some way, but I'm not sure how. Okay, so other than that, uh, let's start for, with today's session and let me actually share the document camera. Okay, so here we will be focusing on the discussions or we continuing the discussions we had in the last lecture and that was with Gaussian elimination. So any questions on Gaussian elimination process? And we saw that specifically with partial pivoting with scaling method. So just to make sure that you guys um, uh, understand the problem, we are interested in performing elementary row operations such that we can get an upper triangular matrix form, form of matrix A. So we are solving A x equals B. This is an for the time being, we are considering it as a square matrix. It need not be square. It can have other dimensions as well. This is n cross one vector, and this is also n cross one vector. And when we are basically trying to solve, we are first forming an augmented matrix by combining A and B together. And uh, then we are performing EROs. EROs basically means elementary row operations. If you remember that we were basically trying to reduce it into an upper triangular matrix form for matrix A and whatever the form we get, we call as row equal, row equivalent form. And while doing this EROs, we are not just doing it um, by brute force method, but we are specifically be concerned with partial pivoting with scaling technique. Is everybody with me so far? Yes. Yeah. Is there anybody who is not yet following what we are doing? Everybody is good, right? Okay, so just I would like to actually pick that specific problem we did so that I can show you. Just give me a second. Uh, okay, so what we were doing on the last uh, lecture, our A matrix was minus four, negative three, five, six, seven, negative three. Then we have two, negative one and one. And we saw our D matrix was, our D vector was zero, two and six. 
and when we actually perform this operation using partial pivoting with scaling operation we saw that the first thing we need to do is i'm just refreshing those steps so that we are all on the same page partial pivoting with scaling operation we need to select the pivot row for corresponding to x1 we need to select pivot row corresponding to x1 the first unknown vector here x1 x2 it has got three unknowns x1 x2 x3 because it has got three by three matrix three by one vector and three by one vector so first uh, selection of pivot row corresponding to x1 so for that we know that we selected R11, which is absolute value of the first row coefficient, I mean coefficient of X1 in the first row divided by the maximum coefficient in that row, which is five. Similarly, we find R12, which is coefficient of X1 in the second row divided by the maximum value in the second row, absolute value in the, absolute maximum value in the second row. Similarly, R13 is two divided by mod two. And what we found that our pivot row was this because it has got the maximum of R1, R, R1, two and R1, three is this. And that means this is our pivot row. And then we interchange that row with the first one. Second row remains as it is in augmented form okay and then we perform further eros to eliminate six and negative four these coefficients corresponding to x1 so eventually what we actually get after several steps what we actually got is uh, two negative one one, zero, 10, negative six, zero, zero, four. And we have here six, negative 16. And is, is everybody with me so far? Yeah. You guys are with me, right? I mean, everybody in the class? Yes. Yep. So yes. the specific form we call as row echelon form. And why we call it a row echelon form? because this A matrix has been converted into an upper triangular matrix. Upper triangular matrix means it has all the elements on the diagonal and above the diagonal. So this is a diagonal element and above the diagonal, you have all the entries. Below the diagonal, all are zero. So this is called as upper triangular matrix. And this specific form is called as row echelon form of augmented matrix. So this is Row echelon. row echelon form basically means that you have done all these ele elementary row operations of interchanging the rows and then eliminating any, any questions here. Okay, so interchanging the rows, eliminating the coefficients, making it an upper triangular form and whatever we got, this is basically we call as a row echelon form. And then we use back substitution to solve for x3, x2 and x1. That's what we saw. Now, so this is a generic case or basically a very general case when you have the system of equations giving you a unique solution. So here we are actually basically for this system, we saw that we got x3, we got as one, x2, we got as uh, negative one and x1, we got as two. So by back substitution, we got this. So this is a unique solution for this system of equation where ax equals b, there a is this and b is this. Now, there will be cases when you may not have any solution at all, or you may have infinitely many solutions. So when that is possible, or how to basically check whether uh, the system has no solution or infinitely many solutions. Because um, when you are asking the code or any specific code, whether it is written in MATLAB, whether it is written in C, or whether it is written in any other programming language, when you are solving this and you are getting this equivalent form to equivalent form, and you are doing this back substitution, then you need to be aware that uh, the solution exists. If there is some situation, let me actually write it down. So I'm just 
basically giving an giving some cases some cases with rho equivalent form but after doing all this partial pivoting and scaling you are in up with this specific form 0 10 negative 6 0 0 0 6 negative 16 0 are you getting what I'm trying to say here? So after you do all those elementary row operations, this is what you got, final row equivalent form. For example, this is case one, let's say. So this is what you got. This is for specific, for specific value of A and specific value of B. I'm not, at least at this point of time, not asking you to see what that A and B is, but after you do all these operations, you end up with this. Now, when you do back substitution, What will you get? You will get zero times x3 equals zero, right? Are you getting what I'm saying, guys? Yeah. So basically it means that there is, x3 can have any specific value. So this last equation says zero times x3 equals zero because we are doing back substitution. If I actually let you know what back substitution is. So if you remember that once we got that row equivalent form, now the code is doing what? It's going to do back substitution. It will, it will try to solve first this equation, four times x3 equals four. It will get x3 equals one. Then it will substitute this value in the second equation, which is 10 times x2 negative six, x3 is equals to negative 16. So it will substitute x3 value here to solve for x2, which will got negative one. Then it will solve this equation and it will be two times x1 negative x2 plus x3 equals six. So it will substitute x3 and x2 in this equation to solve for x1, which will be two. So that's how the, that's how the systematically the rules are followed that you got a row equivalent form and then from the last row, you actually solve for x3, then x2, then x1. So similarly, let's say if somehow I end up with this case. Now, when I do back substitution, I mean, I am now in the code, I don't know anything, but these numbers represent, I'm just following the rules. The rules tell me that this row multiplied by x3 equals this. So I multiplied by this. Now I see that it's basically unsolvable or x3 is basically zero divided by zero. It is undefined, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So basically this is the case when you have infinite many solutions for your system of equation, for the system of equation. And why it is happening? Because this x3 is now your far less free variable. It can take any non-zero integer. So it can take any non-zero number. If I put x3 equals uh, one, it will be defined. If I took x3 equals two, it will be defined. So basically it will satisfy this equation. So if I pick any three, x3 as one, it still satisfies this equation. If I pick two, three, any number, negative one, negative two, any number, it can take, choose any number. And that is what we call as that this is your free variable. Free variable means if you end up with this situation where your last row in the row, row equivalent form is all zeros. That means you have got one variable as free variable, which can take any value you like, you choose. And depending on that chosen value, x1 and x2 will be dependent on that. Does it make sense, guys? Yeah, I follow. I'm asking other guys as well. If you have any questions, please interrupt me. I will be more than happy to explain. If you're not following it, it will become difficult to follow the other parts when we go further. So X3 becomes infinite. I mean, it becomes a free variable. It can, pick, it can take any number. And generally in their situation, the, the practice is you take X3 equals one and you solve for X1 and X2. If that situation happens. So that is the generic general practice. However, there is no such uh, 
no such requirement that x3 has to be one it can be any number but depending on that specific x3 you will get a specific x1 and x2 so this is what we call as infinitely many solutions and it is happening because this specific overturn form has got all zeros in the last row and that also tells us about the rank of a matrix so if you remember the rank of the matrix is or if you have read uh, chapter number eight the rank of a matrix if it is equals to rank of a augmented matrix that means the solution exists when this case happens solution exists for the system of equation a x equals b now what is rank rank is basically number of non zeros in the row equivalent form so in this case the number of non zeros if i talk about number of non zero rows in the matrix a what how many number of non zeros do i have got here let me actually randomly pick a student and that will help us to engage you guys a bit more so let's say i have koi yes so how many number of non zero rows do i have in this matrix in the matrix a this is a this is matrix a or basically a modified form of a in the row equivalent form so how many non zero rows i have here uh zero non zero rows so this is a non um, Oh, this is a non-zero row. This oh, is a three, three. 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 And how many non-zero rows I have for A and B for this augmented matrix? So in three non-zero. Three non-zeros. So you see, rank of A is basically number of non-zero rows in this form, and rank of A and B, which is augmented form, is number of non-zeros in this row equivalent form so this row equivalent form is very important in the sense that once you do all this partial pivoting and you eliminate all those coefficients and make it in upper triangle form this form is final form is important in the sense it tells you about the rank of the matrix so if you have non zero rows of a which is basically tells you the rank of a so rank of a is 3 in this case and rank of a and dash b which is augmented matrix is also 3 so if that is true then the solution exists and the same thing happens for here so let me ask uh, somebody else and uh, let's say uh, mohammed kasim yes yes two and two how many non zero rows we have for a two, two right yes and for a b augmented two two so again we see this is equals to the i mean the rank of a is just rank of a uh, dash b which is augmented matrix then the solution exists now in this case if the rank is equals to n your system of equations you have n by n matrix and you have equals to n then you have got unique solution so here you have got unique solution if it is equals to n if rank of a equals rank of a b equals n i have unique solution if if rank of a is equals to rank of a b less than n then i have infinite many solutions that's what you are seeing here rank of a is 2 rank of a b is 2 as well and it is less than 3 which is less than n that means i have infinite many solutions the third case is when the solution does not exist when if rank of a is less than rank of a b augmented matrix no solution and this is the case what may happen let me actually use a separate sheet now so so i have a case 2 uh, there may be some mess here 
Let's give me a few minutes. Sorry, I'm not able to open the chat window. Just give me a second. Can you go back, please, Professor? Just give me a second. Yeah, just somehow the chat window is dis has disappeared. So that's what not. Okay, so you want me to go back to the previous one. Okay, that's the one. Which one you like to go? Last one. Last one. So what I was basically saying the rank of A is less than the augmented matrix rank, then in that case, you don't have any solution. So I was just trying to show with a specific example. Okay. So if rank of A is equals to rank of augmented matrix, that is unique solution. If it's less than N, N many, infinitely many solutions, and if it is less than rank of A is less than the augmented matrix, then we have no solution. So I was basically just trying to show that specific scenario where you have, let's say, after you do all the elementary row operations, you end up with something like this. So now you can see what is rank of A here. Can you guys tell me what the rank of A would be? Two. Be two. Two. And what is rank of A, B, the augmented matrix? Three. Three. And you see that this specific uh, system has no solution. Do you see what I'm saying here? Yes? Yeah, I follow. Okay. Any questions still so far till now? Um, Professor, can you go over uh, rank of A and rank of A depth, please? So rank of A is basically number of, so this is a row equivalent form. Row equivalent form is basically you obtained after doing all the elementary row operations and doing all this partial pivoting. So in this case, number of non-zero rows in this matrix A in the final row equivalent form. So number of non-zero rows I have is only two. That is what you are actually getting. Does it make sense? Okay, okay. But when I'm talking about rank of A and B, which is augmented matrix, which is this matrix. So in that case, I have number of non-zeros are one, two, and three. This row is still non-zero. That means it has got a number. So that means it has got rank three. So that in that scenario, we basically have no solution if they are not matching. Okay, got it. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, any questions, guys? So that's basically the thing I wanted to discuss about the rank. Another thing is that for square matrices, you can easily determine the rank of matrix A. rank of A is given by the determinant, a non-zero determinant, is indicated by a non-zero determinant of A. Basically, if you take the determinant of A and let's say determinant of matrix A, is presented by this, if it is non-zero, that means it has got rank, full rank matrix. The rank of A is basically its N, where A is a N by N matrix. Does it make sense? So you can also quickly see if the determinant is non-zero. Determinant is zero, that means rank of A is not N, it is less than N. So basically, at least you know that it does not have a unique solution in that scenario. Repeat that one more time. So in case determinant of A is non-zero, that means rank of A is equals to N, which is its full rank. However, if the determinant comes out to be zero, then you know the rank of A is not equal to it is less than N, and you do not have unique solution in that scenario. So let me write it down. If determinant of A 
is equals to zero, that means A matrix is called a singular matrix. Singular matrix. And in that scenario, in this scenario, you do not have a unique solution. No unique solution exists. No unique solution for unknown X. Okay, guys. Let me know if you have any questions. No questions at this time, Professor. Mm -hmm. Anybody has any questions so far? Or you guys are good? Assuming you guys are following. So let me move to some other topic here, which is a continuation of this Gaussian elimination. So what happens that in Gaussian elimination, the number- What does it say at the very bottom? Which one? Okay, yeah, just that one, solution for unknown. No unique solution for unknown vector x, if the singular matrix, if the A matrix is singular. Okay, if determinant of A equals zero, then A is a singular matrix. Gaussian elimination process generally requires Got it, thank you. Uh, approximately N cube operations, N cube multiplications, and all of N cube, N cube mathematical operations. There is specific number is four by two or four by three or four by five, I forgot that number, but it is basically proportional to N cube. N cube basically means that if you have size N, this is three cross four augmented matrix A is three by three. So if this N is basically the size of the number of rows in matrix A or basically size of matrix A. So is the whole elimination process basically takes almost n cube mathematical operation. So if n is around 100, that means you have 100 unknown vectors, you can still see, you can basically see how these things will keep on scaling up. So basically you require 100 times 100 times 100 mathematical operations and it will become very, very slow. The process will become very slow. For n equals three, five, seven, it doesn't matter. But as you, as we know that this system of equations are used in solvers like uh, find element solvers or CFD solvers or any other solvers. So they actually tend to solve this system of equations for many, many number of large number of variables, maybe thousand, maybe 10,000. And if you have to do this operations, you basically, you will see that the computation process will be very, very slow as the, as the equations number of mesh increases, mesh density increases, or number of unknown increases in the, sol in the, in the solver, then the operations will take on longer. So probably you have come across the situation when you have a large mesh and it may take one day or two days for the computer simulation to finish it. But if you have a small size of mesh, it will finish in maybe five minutes, maybe 10 minutes or so. So it all depends on the specific, how much, uh, how much pros, how much operations are basically being done by a specific system. Now to deduce that uh, number of operations or to make the system faster or computation faster, so all everywhere you, you see the research happening in this area in mathematics, specifically in optimization processes, to make sure that how can you reduce the number of operations and get the same solution. So one of the techniques that is generally used is called as LU decomposition. LU decomposition basically means L stands for lower triangular form. And U stands for upper triangular form. So what LU decomposition says, LU decomposition of matrix A. So what LU decomposition says that any matrix A, any square matrix A can be represented by this matrix L and U, where L and U forms are given by this specific representation, L11, L22. Let's say I'm working with only three by three matrix at this time. 
L1, 2, L1, 3, L2, 3. And U is U1, 1, U2, 2, U3, 3, 0, 0, 0, U1, 2, U1, 3, U2, 3. So this is called lower triangular matrix because it has got all the diagonal elements and all the entries below the diagonal are non-zero. All the entries above the diagonal are zeros. Similarly, this is your upper triangular form, okay? So any matrix A can be decomposed like this form. And I will let you know how it is basically going to help you out. So if you can represent a matrix like this, and you come back to your original system of equation, which is A times X equals B, now instead of A, you write it as L U X equals B. You represent this by Y. Then you have L times Y equals B. And Y is our solved by uh, forward substitution, solve Y by forward substitution. And once you solve for y, then u of x equals y, solve for x using back substitution. So let me randomly pick a student from the attendees here. Uh, Vanessa? Yes, professor. So do you understand about what, what this mean by back substitution, right? Yes. Right? So what we actually do in back substitution is basically we solve for the unknown vectors x by taking the last row. So what is forward substitution then? It would be picking the, um, the first. Yes, exactly. Yes. So what we are doing here, that if you look at this, the form of L is like this. So if I actually look at my L, it is L1100, L12, L220, L13, L23, L33, times Y. Y is my unknown here, Y1, Y2, Y3. B is known to me, so it is B1, B2, B3. So forward substitution means that instead of picking the last row, I'm picking the first row. When I pick the first row, I know my first row basically gives me this equation. And I solve for y1. That's my, that's my forward substitution. I, sub I solve for y1. Then I use this y1 and use the second row and solve for y2. Then I solve for y1. I, I mean, after getting y1 and y2, I pick the third row and solve for y2. Is everybody getting what I'm saying here? Yes. Uh, anybody has any question? Are you not following it? So this is what we call as you take Y1, then Y2, and you solve for Y3. This is what we call as forward substitution. And similarly, once you got substitution, once you got Y1, Y2, Y3, that means this, now use back substitution to solve for x1, x2, and x3, because your u is basically in upper triangular form. That's what we have seen in our Gaussian elimination process, that we always try to uh, reduce it into an upper triangular form. 0, 0, 0, x1, x2, x3, y1, y2, y3, and we already have solved for y1, y2, y3s, and you can basically now use back substitution to solve for x3, then x2, and x1. That is back substitution. Is everybody with me so far? Yeah? I have not, I have not told you how to get L and U. I will, I'm just going to tell you in a second, but assuming that you can decompose any square matrix A into L and U, L matrix and U matrix, where L is your lower triangular matrix, U is an upper triangular matrix. If you can decompose that into this form, I will tell you how to do that. 
But if you do that, then you actually come back to this formulation and use forward substitution and back substitution to get solve for x. Is everybody with me in that in that discussion in that specific uh, line of thought we are having here? Could you say it one more time? Okay, so let's say you got L and U's for a specific matrix A. You know how to find L and U, L matrix and U matrix for a given A. So if you know how to get that, then you use this equation, substitute A as L times U, and then you substitute U times X as Y, you solve for Y using forward substitution, just that we discussed now. And once you solve for Y, then you solve for X using back substitution. Are you following this much? So if you're not following it, please let me know which step you are not following. I'll try to explain it. I think that's... Is everybody with me so far? Yes, Professor. Professor, could you give an example of this? Of course, we will do examples, but not now, because if we keep on doing this type of examples, uh, I mean, it will take us not six months to finish or three months or four months to finish this and it will take us basically maybe a year or so. So what I can say that instead of these variables, you can assume that these are numbers. So that's it. So examples basically means you are basically having these numbers. I will, I will um, recommend you or suggest you to basically run, work through your examples on your own basically after you actually are done with the course because during the course lectures, it will be very hard to take one single example for each specific scenario. So that's the reason I'm not having specific examples at this point of time. Got it. But these are just numbers. I mean, I can, I can arbitrarily made up these numbers, but if it, may, if it helps you, so let me try if it helps you. So instead of L1, I will have just arbitrary numbers here now, two, five, two minus seven, zero. Uh, Three one five. I mean, if it is, if you basically like this type of representation, I can do that. I don't know if it is helping you because it doesn't make any sense to me to pick any arbitrary numbers. Here. And what I'm doing here, I'm doing forward substitution. That means I'm substitute. I am basically solving for y one, which is two over five, because I solved this. Then I took y two, which I use this equation. I will solve some some number, and similarly, I will get y three. That will I will get some. This is called forward substitution. And once I solve for y one, y two, and y three, let's say these are numbers again. I'm hypothetically making because this, as I said, I am not solving it. Four by nine. I'm just arbitrarily picking the numbers. Now use these numbers to solve for x one, x two, and x three. Now if I take again and have it hypothetical use. So it will be two, four, negative two, three, nine, four, two, zero, zero, zero. X1, X2, X3, and Y1, Y2, Y3 are coming from here. And you solve for X1, X2, X3 using back substitution. Are you getting that? Yeah. So who asked this question, sorry, about this example? I did, Karthik. Karthik. So do you think this sub -ex uh, explanation makes more sense or this explanation makes more sense? I mean, they both make sense. I just like it with like examples and numbers. Okay. How we're gonna see it, so. Okay, sorry for that. But the thing is, as I said, if I just pick one specific, uh, uh, numbers, then it becomes very hard to actually show you. So that is the reason I'm not very intent on saw taking one specific numbers, but I will try to take one example and that may help you, but that's, um, so in the lectures, I tend to be more generic, generic in the sense I'm using variables. So these variables represent numbers. That's what you have to follow. You have to basically understand. And once you understand this concept, the best way I will 
suggest you guys to use a textbook textbook has got a lot of app examples just pick one example and solve it for yourself and you will get the experience of or basically understand the concept that's the best because maths is not by i mean you cannot learn maths by just looking at the lectures or going through the reading it you have to do it by practice that's how the maths have generally you have to learn maths and when i say practice you have to solve it yourself but that is why i'm not picking any numbers at this time right. okay so i apologize for that but uh, tr i'm trying to cover the the concepts using some generic description of the variables and numbers okay so any questions so far a uh, professor i have a question go ahead how we can do a uh, lower triangular sorry come again how we can do lower triangular on the a matrix oh so i'm going to tell you now how to get this but once you get this, are you are you able to understand how to solve for y one, y two, and y three? Yes, I am. I get it. Yeah. So now I'm going to tell you how to actually get L and U's. So what basically we have here is a matrix, and we know it has got. I'm just working on three by three. It need not be three by three. It can be n by n. So it is. It can be n can be as large as thousand, ten thousand. It can be any number. So I'm just working on three by three matrix. And again, these variables represent a specific number. So you have to be careful about that. A one one basically means first row, first column, first row, second column, first row, third column. A two one, A two two, A two three, A three one, A three two, A three three. So this is basically the same, same as like numbers matrices we started with negative three five six seven negative three two negative one one that is the first uh matrix we basically selected is everybody with me so far yeah yeah b vector was zero two six okay so a11 is this a12 just give me a second let me actually uh, close the shades here okay so i have got a matrix and b vector and a11 a11 basically means this number a12 means this number a13 means this number a21 means second row first column second row second column second row third column third row first column third row second column third row third column so this is our a coefficients now i want to decompose into this form U three three zero zero zero. So, uh, let me actually pick a student again. Kenneth Nim. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, if I want to decompose this A matrix into this form, I want to find these variables, these numbers. How many variables I have here? I have one, two, three, four, five, six for lower triangular matrix, right? Oh yeah, right. And how many do I have here in upper triangular form? How many unknowns I have here? How many unknowns I have here in this form in this matrix? Six, professor. So I'm asking Kenneth. Oh, my, my, my uh, yeah, I forgot the first one. Um, unknown. No, no, knowns, uh, unknowns is uh, three. And which one are those? Oh, my bad, my bad. Uh, unknowns oh. are six. The six. U loving. Yeah. yeah, exactly. 
So you see there are six unknowns here, six unknowns here. So basically there are 12 unknowns and I have how many numbers I have got? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, right? Right? Uh oh, so sorry, Professor, you were breaking up. Uh, what was it? What were you saying? How many known numbers I have got in matrix A? Known? Yeah, known numbers. So this is known to me. This is. Oh, known. you have nine. Nine. So I have got 12 unknowns and nine, nine known. So basically what we actually do, we force diagonal of L to be ones. And this is what we call as a uh, do little algorithm. When we do that, what I actually got is, is one, zero, zero, L two, one, one, zero, L three, one, L three, two, one, times U one, one, U one, two, U one, three, U two, two, U two, three, U three, three, zero, zero, zero. And I do matrix multiplication. When I do matrix multiplication. What do I get? I get U one, one, U one two, U one three, then I basically have L two one times U one one, then I have L two one U one two plus U two two, then I have L two one U one three plus U two three. Are you guys getting what I'm doing here? Yeah. Uh, let me basically ask uh, another student here, Victor. Yes, sir. So can you tell me what will be the entry here? L31. Yeah. That's it. I'm doing matrix multiplication of this row with this. I'm doing matrix multiplication. What should be the entry here? Sorry, I let go of the button early. L three one U one one. Yeah. And then what will be here? L three two U two two. No. Uh, uh crap! Sorry, I blanked out. What would be the entry? Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So let me ask somebody else here as well. Quinton. Quinton. If I'm pronouncing it correctly. Okay, if it is not there, Karina, Karina. Karina, are you there? Okay. Roosevelt, Ayala. Yeah, so it would be L31, yeah. uh, U, uh, one, two. Yeah. Uh, plus L32, uh, U two two. Great. And what are you okay? I sorry, do you I was gonna continue. Is that so it was uh, L three one uh U one three plus L three two U two three plus U three three. Okay, thank you. So you see now I have got a specific um matrix which has got unknowns and this needs to be equated with what you with your a matrix which is this which is negative four negative three five six seven negative three two negative one one so now what you do you actually solve for each of these 
nine unknowns using nine equations. So u11 will be corresponding to, will be equal to this. This will be equals to this. This should be equals to this. And same for everybody here. All the element wise needs to be equal to each other. Do you see what I'm doing? I have a question. Did you leave uh, something outside the uh, ma matrix on purpose or is that a? No, it's just like I draw this earlier, so it has to be here. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. So now, now how many unknowns you have got? Since you have already forced these three to be ones, so you have nine unknowns and you have nine equations. So you solve for nine unknowns. Solve nine unknowns using nine equations. Are you able to follow it, guys? So this is like, uh, I guess, a modified forward substitution since you can go, you can start from the top again. So I am not doing any substitution at this point of time. What I'm doing is finding what should be my L matrix looks like and what should be my U matrix looks like. So I'm finding those elements. What will be U matrix and what will be L matrix? These, these are the elements of these matrices. That's what I'm solving for. So I'm not yet solving AX equals to B. I have not gone there. I just showed you how to solve that. I will come back again on that. But here I'm solving how to find L matrix and U matrix. Let me know if you guys follow that one. Did I answer your question? I just forgot who was speaking, who was basically asking that question. Oh yeah, brother. Um, got one more. So um, I, I'm trying to look at those uh, two matrices. I mean, you can pretty much get the the first row because it's only you, the single variable. Yes. But the, the second, third rows are kind of like uh, funky, I guess. And they're like- No, it will, not, it will not be. So I will help you to do that. So let's say U11. So, okay. U11 is negative four. U12 is negative three. U13 is five. That's why you said it very easy. The second row is funky. So let me see you that it's not funky because L21, U11 is six and you already know U11, so L21 is basically six divided by negative four. Similarly, this one, L21, U12 plus U22. You will find that whenever you are coming to this specific entries, everything else is known other than the unknown because L21 is known and U12 is known. U12 is here, L21 is here. So you know L21 and U12, you solve for U22. Oh, thank you. Yeah, and you keep on doing that. So that is basically, it looks like a bit messed up, like it with so many equations are there, but when you actually look at it, it is basically following an iterative step. So you solving for one variable at a time when you're moving from one from the other. Make sense, guys? Yeah. Okay. So basically it looks like, as I was saying, the equation looks like very difficult to solve, but it is not because these are all getting solved for one entry at a time. So here you is very simple. Here also it is very simple because whenever you are working on with one entry, you will see that you are only solving for one variable. So L21 times U11, you already have solved for U11 earlier. So you solve for L21 first. Now, if you take this entry here also, you are basically solving for only L31 because U11 is known. If you look for here, I mean, you have to go sequentially. You just cannot jump from this point to this point. So you have to either go sequentially, sequentially, sequentially like this or like this. So you have to go sequentially. And if you go sequentially, you will find that every equation will only need to be solved for one variable. So is everybody with me that you have, you can get L matrix and U matrix? Yeah. Is there anybody who is not following that how to get those matrices and what they actually mean? Is everybody with me? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So now basically again, I go back to this sheet where I showed you that if you have got L and U's, which is this form. So you know how we just saw, saw that you actually solve for specific uh, set of equations to solve for these coefficients. And once you get L and U's, 
then you actually use this forward substitution and back substitution. You basically write A as L times U matrix and U times X is represented as Y. So you solve for Y first using forward substitution, which is this form. And then once you got Y, you basically use this equation to solve for X using back substitution. Are you with me now? Yeah. And the, there is the specific thing that I mentioned that you force the diagonal of L to be one. That is what we call as do little algorithm. There's another method we call as Krauts algorithm where where you force the diagonal of not L, but use. So both ways will work. The idea is that instead of 12 unknowns, you want to work with nine unknowns because I have got only nine entries here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I have got only nine entries. So I can solve for nine unknowns. I cannot solve for more than nine unknowns. That is why I'm forcing either these entries to be one or these entries to be one. So force diagonal of U to be all one. So in that case, you have L11, L21, L21, 0, 0, L22, 0, L32, L33, times 1, 1, 1, U12, U13, U two, three. Is everybody following it, what I'm doing here? What algorithm is that? This is called Krauts algorithm. In Doolittle's algorithm, you force the diagonal entry of L to be one. And in Crowd's algorithm, you force the diagonal entry of U to be one. So you see this is one, but these now are not ones. Else is L1. So you have again nine variables. Here also you have nine variables. Here also you have nine variables. Nine unknowns. And here also you have nine unknowns. Does it make sense, guys? Yes. Yeah. Any questions so far? Okay, if there are no questions. So I told you the part, I told you at the beginning that uh, when we were basically discussing this concept, I told you that the Gaussian elimination process I mean, you must be wondering why we are doing all this thing. We can only do Gaussian elimination and we can solve for AX equals B. The only problem is that this process works if uh, you have N is small, but if N is very large, like 100, 200, 1000, 10,000 or so, the computation time will be very, very, very large. And to reduce the computation time, there are several techniques that people are investigating and basically come, have come up with, which reduces the number of operations that are required to solve the system of equation ax equals b so lu decomposition whether it is crowds algorithm where you you force these entries to be one or whether you use do little algorithm where you force these entries to be one you those lu decomposition based solution of ax equals to b is half of gaussian elimination so imagine that you takes one day to solve your finite element solver to give you results now using LU decomposition, it will take half the day. So you basically see it is a huge advantage in terms of uh, computation time or saving computational resources when the number of systems are to be solved are very, very large. As I said, if you have, you are working with three by three matrices, it doesn't make any difference. But these things will start making difference when you have large system of equations to solve. Basically, uh, everything's like, of course, uh, Solution we're looking for is just for square matrices, I guess, this time. Yes, at this point, yes. But it need not be. I can, I will also tell you how to find the solve for system of equations which is not square. Okay. Yeah. 
So we will take, we will actually discuss that that aspect as well. It is not in there in your textbook, but we will discuss that. If your if your matrix is not square, basically you have large number of equations, but uh, your number of unknowns are less. So x is less. So basically, what I'm talking about is a system of equation where a is m cross n, x is n cross one, and b is n cross one. So this is the generic system of equation where m and n are not equal, that is means not square. So if m is greater than n, then basically we have more equations and less unknowns. And more equations, less unknowns. So how to solve for x in that scenario? So that is one case. Another case is when m is less than n, that means your system, your equations are less, but the unknowns are more. So as you know that you do not have a um, unique solution in that scenario, you will have to assume some of the, uh, some of the variables. We will, we will look those cases as well. So those are the scenarios we will discuss. Um, I mean, that's a good point to ask, Reis, and I will, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you asked this question. So uh, we will basically discuss these specific scenarios in our lecture. That what will happen if your A matrix is not a square matrix? What will happen in that scenario? Okay, any questions so far? Yes. You guys are good? Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, discuss this in the next lecture. I'm, I'm think we can wrap it, uh, wrap our discussion today. The important step or important things that we discussed today, let me uh, re revisit some of them. So we, I started with a re recap of what we have learned in the last lecture, which is partial pivoting with scaling and using Gaussian elimination technique. The objective was to perform elementary row operations so that you get a row equivalent form. Row equivalent form means the matrix A has got an upper triangular formulation or upper triangular form. So in that case, if uh, I have a so solution existing, then I use back substitution to solve for x3, then x2, and then x1 using back substitution. This is an upper triangular matrix. So this is how you form, you basically solve for x using back substitution. Now you there are intermediate steps of how to select the pivot row and do the partial pivoting and all these things that we discussed. Then we discuss some cases where the solution may exist, may not exist. So in this specific scenario, when I have the rank of the matrix and the rank of A augmented matrix is same, then, and it is less than N, that means I have infinitely many solutions, which is basically this specific scenario where you have the last row all zero. If you have more zeros, if you have any rows which have all zeros, that means it has got infinitely many solutions. So just a quick, um, let me um, basically just uh, quickly ask, just like a short question, let me pick a standard student again. Uh, Isaac Zaldana. Isaac? Can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Sorry. Okay, so let's say, uh, just for the sake of curiosity, if we have got this formulation, 0, 0, 0, 0, 2, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. So how many solutions do you think the system has? I would say no solution. And why do you say so? Because of that sec, uh, I just look at that second row and I see like x three zero times x three equals two. Wait, no, actually, yeah. So zero equals two second row. Okay, so that is one way. Another way that I just discussed that you find the rank of this A and rank of A and B augmented. Matrix. So rank of A is how much? It is it's one. One. And what is rank of augmented matrix? How much? Two. Two. And that basically means it doesn't have any solution because right. they are not matching. Right? 
now or let me again ask somebody else now here mm. michael david yeah what's up okay. okay so i have a question for you and this is what i am getting let's say this is for a hypothetical scenario i am getting this so how many solutions do i have in this scenario uh that would be infinite and how do i solve for x1 x2 and x3 uh you can say okay you know x3 is equal to 1 and then x2 is equal to something else and then you can solve for 1 so what is that something else because i want a specific number right a, it can be any number that's that's the whole point yeah exactly so what can that number be what number you would like to select one okay so that's basically i was trying to lead you to that that assuming or basically understanding that this has got infinitely many solutions everybody agrees because rank of a and rank of a are same and this is less than n that means it has got infinitely many solutions now as i said the generic practice is whenever you have a free variable the free variable is chosen as one that is basically a generic practice general practices i mean there is no hard and fast rule that you have to select that as one it can select be any number but the general rule is whatever the free variables are you select that as one and then you solve for x one does it make sense yeah yeah great thank you free variables are chosen as one as a general practice no hard and fast rule but that is general practice is everybody following it yeah follow it for yes for us so that's what we discussed which was we basically discussed about the rank of the system of the met of the system of equations if rank of a and rank of a augmented matrix are same that means solution exists and if that is equals to n unique solution if it is less than n then you have infinitely many solutions and if the rank of a is less than rank of augmented matrix then you have no solution at all so that is what we discussed thereafter we discussed about uh, uh about well the specific sorry specific no solution case and then we also told you that you can find the rank easily by finding the determinant of the matrix a and if the determinant is non zero that means rank of a is a full rank basically it is called rank n but if determinant of a is zero that means a is a singular matrix in that scenario the rank of a is less than n and there is no unique solution for unknown vector x that's what we discussed and after that we basically moved our discussion towards this where we talked about the computation time for gaussian elimination it takes around n cube operations and there are different techniques to reduce the number of operations so for lu decomposition you can reduce the number of operations by half so in lu decomposition you are decomposing a matrix a in terms of lower rank and upper triangular form and then you use forward substitution back substitution to solve for x how to get ln use you basically use one of these algorithm the doodle algorithm or the crowds algorithm wherein you are forcing the diagonal of the l matrix to be one and you solve for all the other entries using the and equation and nine variables similarly if you force all the u's or diagonals of u to be one then it is crowds algorithm and you solve for all the entries using nine equations that you have and that's how you get ln u and once you get ln u vector matrices then you can solve for x as we just discussed so that's basically recap of what we did today and let me know if you have any questions or you have not followed it so far professor is there like um i guess like a guideline to which is like more convenient to find like is it l or u is it like something like that or both are both are the same actually both will take same amount of time so there is no uh no advantage on using any one of them so both algorithms will give you the same will take same computation time okay. yeah. any other questions guys so in the next lecture as i discussed we will take this specific scenario generic case and also uh, we will see one more technique i mean there are several techniques that we need to learn to solve ax equals b this system of equation but one technique that is very important that will be used in the later half of the course as well 
which is how to solve for tridiagonal matrices. So we will actually see if we get time to time in the next lecture. We'll also look for tridiagonal matrices. So I will stop uh, our discussion today at this point of time. But as I suggest, uh, I was mentioning that it is basically difficult for me to take these individual examples and work through them in the lectures because then it will be like it will take a lot of time to finish the topics we need to do. So once I go through these concepts in the class, I would suggest you guys to please work with your textbook examples and go through it, go through the numerical problems yourself. Because without practicing yourself and without doing it using your pen and pencil, it becomes hard to follow. And if you just think like just attending the lectures will help you to do all the learning that may work with other subjects, but for maths, it generally doesn't work that way. So you have to practice and practice and practice. That's what the thumb rule is for learning maths. And um, with that said, uh, please work with your solution, with your textbook examples, and let me know if you have any issues or any questions so far in the next lecture.